Okay, I think we'll make a start. There might be a couple coming in late. Um, thank you very much for coming along. I'm very pleased to welcome along Rachel Herman from the University of Southampton, where she's a lecturer in early modern American history. Um, she did her PhD at the University of Texas, Austin, and uh, moved to Southampton two years ago, I think. Um, she's presently working on a book, Manuscripts, uh, from which this talk is, is drawn now, which is called No Useless Mouth, Food Diplomacy, Fictional Warfare and Revolutionary Atlantic, which examines how Native Americans, free blacks and slaves, used food to wage war and broke a peace during and after the American Revolution. As well as this, she's also published in the William and Mary Quarterly from 2011, um, an article on cannibalism and abundance in colonial Jamestown, which sounds rather macabre. Um, and she also writes for the Chronicle in higher education and is a founding member of the, a blog called The Junto, which is a blog on early American history. Talk today, as you can see, is called A Black Loyalist Food Rights in 18th Century Sierra Leone Food Insecurity, Food Laws, and Violence. So I'll hand over to Rachel, she's going to talk about 35, 45 minutes, and then we'll open up the questions. So. Right, uh, well, thanks to Bevan and to the Department of American and Canadian Studies and to all of you for making it here to hear my talk. I know we're at the point in the semester where everyone is feeling slightly crazed, so I appreciate your taking the time to come out today. Uh, I am going to be talking about a case study today involving black loyalists. Uh, but before I do that, I wanted to provide some background information on the book project, uh, which is my first book project. Um, so uh, the project, No Useless Mouth, Food Diplomacy, Vital Warfare, and the Revolutionary Atlantic, asked this question of how Native Americans, free blacks, and slaves used food to engage in violence and uh, form alliances during and after the American Revolution. I argue that food diplomacy and vital warfare were two opposing yet related ways of uh, communicating um, and were therefore ways of brokering power. Um, I define food diplomacy as the use of consumable goods to uh, gain or maintain alliances. Um, and vital warfare is the destruction or theft of crops and domesticated animals. In later years, it also uh, involves the use of food to control the mobility of different groups of people. Um, the project is comprised of a number of case studies. So I look at uh, Iroquois, Creek, Cherokee, and Western Confederacy Indians, uh, as well as the former slaves who gradually become black loyalists, leaving the United States and entering these increasingly transnational worlds. Uh, in terms of sources, I, I like military manuscripts a lot. So I draw on uh, the military manuscripts of the British Indian Department uh, at the British Library, uh, letters in various archives in the United States, treaty and council minutes, um, and the colonial records of Nova Scotia and Sierra Leone on repository at Kew um, and Library and Archives Canada. So before I move on to the case study, I'd like to ask, answer these two brief questions of why food and why the American Revolution. Um, because this is uh, in part an American studies department, I don't feel like I need to make the same justification uh, for studying food that I sometimes make to other audiences. I think um, there's a basic assumption here that food matters because everyone eats. Uh, and that food provides a way to write the histories of people who leave behind too few written records. But food is also different because it's not necessarily always an economic commodity. Um, yes, it can be bought and sold. Um, but during the American Revolution, everyone is a producer, consumer, and destroyer of food which means that food takes on symbolic as well as practical meanings. So that's my kind of spiel about why food matters. On then to this question of why the American Revolution. Uh, I want to suggest that the revolution itself matters because historians have asserted that the destruction of foodstuffs, what I call vital warfare, was a type of warfare in flux 
at precisely this time period. So whereas in the 16th and 17th century, Europeans saw a little problem with scorched earth campaigns of food destruction, by the 18th century, they had mostly ceased that practice when they fought each other. During the American Revolution, though, they, just, they, they justified their food destruction of Native American villages, um, in part because the rules of law and the rules of war do not apply to Indians. Um, so there is a, a sort of flexibility in forms of warfare, precisely during this time period um, when you fight Indians. After the revolution ended, vital warfare transforms further to include an increasing number of restrictive food laws that rather than protecting consumers in a traditional moral economy, tended to disadvantage specific groups of people. So the big question here is how does this transition occur? Um, which brings me to the case study that I'll be talking about today, the Black Loyalists. Um, I'm talking about the Black Loyalists as a case study that demonstrates the later stages of this transition um, and the later stages of the book project. Uh, so my story begins in October 1793 with two Black Loyalists named Cato Perkins and Isaac Anderson. Perkins and Anderson have gone to London to petition on behalf of the other black loyalists living in Freetown, Sierra Leone. And they were hungry. So just to give you a sense, this is a, an earlier map uh, of Sierra Leone that I like to use because it's sort of beautiful. Um, and this is a more contemporary map of Sierra Leone at uh, the time just after the Black Loyalists' arrival um, in the colony. So prior analysis of the Black Loyalists' lives have focused on a couple things. They focused on land allotment failures. Um, they focused on discontent between the Black Loyalists and the White Council in Sierra Leone. Um, but my intervention is to suggest that provisioning and experiences with restrictive food laws significantly reshaped their experiences when they migrated to Sierra Leone. Whereas in Nova Scotia, where they lived previously, um, whereas in Nova Scotia, white loyalist laws had controlled former slaves' activities in the marketplace, in Sierra Leone, these black loyalists reenacted strikingly similar food laws um, in an attempt to regulate the behavior and trade of indigenous Africans, um, and particularly the Koya Temne. Once the Black Loyalists began using these food laws, in part to differentiate themselves from neighboring populations, tensions rose. It's violent Temne reactions to colonist price fixing uh, that encourage the white council's curtailment of black loyalist lawmaking. The black loyalists engaged in a so-called rebellion in 1800 because these challenges infringed on what the loyalists saw as their political, legal, and religious rights. So I'm gonna be making two points today. Um, first is that 18th century Freetown suffered from staggering food insecurity. Uh, the second point is that Black Loyalists' efforts to legislate against scarcity and against hunger led to the 1800 uprising, which was actually an early modern food riot. Historians have portrayed this event as the climax of conflict between the Sierra Leone Council and the Black Loyalists, but in addition to these religious divisions, these land quarrels, it's the passage of food laws that plays a significant role in fomenting this episode. And so the assertion that I started with, this assertion that Perkins and Anderson were hungry is really just a starting point. This case study engages with the work that food studies scholars have done on power while arguing for a closer look at the early modern period. The Black Loyalists did not have to contend with a modern national food policy produced in England. Rather, a small 
previously enslaved portion of the population wrote a food system that revised the ineffective food system put into place by white officials. Their 1800 food riot then stands at a crossroads between early modern food history and the rise of state controlled food politics of the 20th century. The riot embodied characteristics of other 18th century riots, um, but in enacting food laws intended to dominate indigenous Africans, the Black Loyalists also staked a claim to more modern political and legal rights. So the question here is, how do we get to the year 1800? How do we get to this year of riot? Uh, to give you a little bit of background, um, the Black Loyalists are former slaves who have fled to the British during the American Revolution um, as a result of proclamations such as Lord Dunmore's up here on the board um, of November 1775 and Henry Clinton's later Phillipsburg proclamation. These proclamations promised protection to the slaves of rebel masters. Um, we know that Isaac Anderson and Cato Perkins had been slaves in South Carolina where they uh, pledged allegiance with their feet by running to the British during the war. Um, it's proclamations like Dunmore's, like Clinton's, that result in the, the, the formation of roaming bands of former slaves who descend on the plantations of former masters, stealing things like crops, stealing things like animals for the support of British troops. Um, it also sets a precedent of using food to engage in violence, which is something that I talk about earlier in the project. Um, as we know, the British did not win the war. Uh, and so at the end of the revolution, um, the loyalists have to leave the American colonies. Um, and this is a map of the loyalist diaspora from Maya Jasanoff's book, uh, Liberty's Exiles. Uh, so at the end of the revolution, over 60,000 loyalists departed the American colonies. Uh, over 30,000 white loyalists established themselves in present day Canada. A separate group of 3,000 black loyalists moved there as freedmen beginning in 1782. So what I'm going to do is I'm aware that this story gets increasingly more and more complicated. So I've provided just a really brief chronology um, that goes through the period not covered as extensively uh, in this talk today. Um, so from 1782 to 83, these former slaves live in Nova Scotia. Um, and until the mid 1780s, say, the absence of public marketplaces in locations such as Halifax and Shelburne allows black hucksters to buy and sell fish, bread, meat, and garden produce where they wish, um, frequently turning a decent uh, profit. By the late 1780s, however, a failure to apportion land combined with a root, uh, rise in restrictive food laws, um, which, by the way, are not directed at the black loyalists, um, but have the effect of circumscribing their food ways uh, specifically for reasons that we can talk about. Um, a rise in restrictive food laws prompts migration out of Nova Scotia. In 1792, over a thousand of the blacks moved to Sierra Leone. Uh, the period until 1793 is right about where this talk picks up. Um, it's characterized by land scarcity, staggering food insecurity, um, famine, death, disaster. Uh, things improve during the mid 1790s. Um, when the black loyalists create these food laws that the Sierra Leone Council regularly approves. Um, by the late 1790s, uh, deteriorating relations between the loyalists and the Temne um, causes the white council to stop encouraging black loyalist lawmaking. Um, and then in 1800, we have this food riot, which begins in September of that year. Um, so that's the sort of chronology um, that, that provides the background to what I'm talking about. So in the first instance, we have 
uh, this problem of food insecurity. And here I'm going to insert a shameless plug uh, for this essay that was recently published, um, and it's part of what I'm drawing on uh, when I talk about food insecurity in Sierra Leone. So there are a number of factors that result in food insecurity in the colony. Um, unpredictable initial relations with the Temne, corruption among white council members, changeable weather, storage issues, um, and sea attacks makes the colony uh, deeply food insecure. Uh, in terms of weather, there's a rainy season that runs from May to October, um, making it difficult to grow crops and shelter animals. Uh, in terms of relations with the Temne, the, white, the, the loyalists arrive in early 1792. Um, at that time, the dominant indigenous African group in the region uh, is the Temne. And historiographically, uh, this is characterized as a time and a place where British power is incredibly weak. Um, so uh, the Temne do not trust the British. Uh, they go so far as to accuse the British of poisoning one of their own with a cup of chamomile tea. It creates this trial um, and really problematic scenario um, and further underscores the sort of lack of good, peaceful relations during these initial months. Um, these shaky relations make it unlikely uh, initially that the Temne will enter Freetown to sell food to the British colonists and the black loyalists. Um, there's also the problem of outside attack, um, which occurs a little bit later in this cr uh, chronology in 1794, um, but it remains a threat from the beginning and throughout the time of the colony's existence. Um, so the French attack Freetown in September 1794, likely a result of the Napoleonic Wars. Um, the governor laments the absence of victuals in the colony after, quote, a parcel of Frenchmen emptied a case of port wine into their stomachs before killing over 150 of his fowls and 1,200 of the town's hogs. Uh, the French also insist during their time in the colony um, that they need to begin and end each meal with the Marseille hymn, um, which drives everyone crazy. Um, but I do want to stress the sort of lack of food supplies as the major issue here. Um, so there's the problem of uh, weather, there's the problem of shaky relations with the Temne, there's the problem of outside attack, there's also the problem of the corruption of white council members. So um, the Sierra Leone Council consists of, I think, eight members. Um, these members don't have a designated leader. Um, this is an image of the Reverend John Clarkson, who is the colony superintendent. Um, he's a noted abolitionist. He's responsible for helping to form the Sierra Leone Company and for helping to organize migration from Nova Scotia to Sierra Leone. Um, but he is superintendent for a time rather than governor, which means that he doesn't have the authority to control the behavior of his fellow council members. Um, these councilmen allow themselves extra food and liquor while selling the remaining supplies to indigenous Africans um, rather than distributing them to the colonists, um, also contributing to the state of food insecurity. Lastly, there is the issue of storage problems. Um, the shores of Sierra Leone are surrounded by rocks. Um, when American ships provide casks of beef, molasses, and pork, the containers wash away in the tide before they can be brought ashore. The storehouse that they belatedly built um, after their arrival is a failure. Um, John Clarkson writes that, quote, the damaged cheese and biscuits with other articles in a state of putrefaction created such a stench about the storehouse that these conditions combined with the slurry of rot allowed to lie and soak into the ground outside made Clarkson worry for the health of storehouse employees. By March 1792, provisions are slim. By April, colonists begin eating half rations. And by May of 1792, John Clarkson writes of starvation and um, death in the colony. There's another series of events that results in Clarkson being fired um, and 
Governor Zachary McCauley and Governor William Dawes kind of passing the governorship back and forth between them. I'm not going to go into those details. Um, I will merely say that by the mid 1790s, the situation has improved. Um, and it's improved in large part because the black loyalists have been given broader political powers, um, which they use to enforce good behavior with respect to food. Um, so one of the first instances is the formation of black juries. In 1793, when three white sailors came on shore and killed a duck belonging to one of the settlers, um, they're tried by a jury of 12 blacks. This jury found the sailors guilty, sentenced one to receive 39 lashes, and this sentence is carried out, um, and imposed fines on the other two. The existence of this jury takes place at a time when uh, even free blacks can't sit on juries in the U.S. South. Um, so the White Council's encouragement of the black loyalist political activities is partly responsible for pushing the black loyalists to envision these expanded um, legal rights um, that I would argue paves the way for greater changes. Really crucial then to these changes are the creation um, and proliferation of food laws in the colony. Um, so Governor William Dawes and future Governor Zachary McCauley uh, encourage the formation of Nova Scotia lawmakers um, that become known as the Hundreders and Tithing Men. Collectively, the Hundreders and Tithing Men um, proposed regulations that the Sierra Leone Council has the ability to approve or reject. And it's worth saying that I didn't find any cases of the white Sierra Leone Council um, rejecting their laws. So they are pretty uniformly um, approved of and passed. These laws do a number of things not related to food, obviously, but what I'm interested in is the fact that they standardize prices for bread, meat, fish, and alcohol. Um, these laws fall neatly in keeping with a long Anglo-American tradition. Um, price fixing is a well-established behavior, and people in the early modern period expected that governments would institute regulations um, to offer disenfranchised peoples a just price. These traditions, these precautions against hunger are codified um, between about 1580 and 1630. They're published as the Book of Orders under Charles I, um, and they became common, common practice during the Tudor period in reaction to population growth and the land enclosure movement. These food laws, though, are doubly important in Sierra Leone because although they first target the behavior of fellow colonists, they later turn their attention to provisions coming into the colony through indigenous African channels once we get to the point where relations with the Temne have improved. These food laws make it so that Africans can't come into the colony to sell produce where they want, um, and they make it difficult for Africans to sell things the way that they want to sell them. Um, and so I want to suggest that the conflict that arises as a result of these laws represents a transition from the early modern to the modern period. Whereas in, say, the mid-1790s, the white Sierra Leone Council is okay with and even encourages these laws, by late 1790, they stop supporting them. Um, and I think there are a couple of reasons why this reversal occurs. Um, on one hand, indigenous African leaders complain about them. Um, so a ruler named King Tom says that the colonists have lowered the price of produce too much. You know, there's always this problem when you're talking about laws, uh, this problem that arises when you have to track down whether or not laws were observed or practiced to the letter. Um, and so my solution for dealing with this problem does draw on Africans' reactions to the laws. Um, one leader's reactions are not necessarily representative. Um, so I want to present other evidence suggesting that these laws were not well received. Um, 
In addition to King Tom's complaints, um, there are instances in the records at Kew of indigenous Africans beginning to steal and to poison colonist cattle. It's around this time that the Black Loyalists um, emphasize and re-emphasize the fact that they are British subjects, um, and they insist that they have the right to continue to fix prices. Um, the September 1800 riot then takes place, and I'm going to get into the events of the riot itself. Uh, but before I did that, I wanted to provide a little bit of background on the historiography of other early modern food riots. Um, so regular early modern food riots tend to fall within the context of E.P. Thompson's moral economy. Um, and historians like John Bostead have delineated several different types of riots. Um, so in the entrave, um, which I'm sure I am mispronouncing, my French is terrible, I apologize. Um, in the entrave, people prevented the export of grain from a rural area. In an agrarian demonstration, farmers destroyed their produce before it could depart from a given area. In the price riot, people seized food, set what they deemed a just price, and sold it. In a market riot, urban crowds acted out against local magistrates or commercial agents, such as bakers, butchers, or millers, in order to force a reduction of prices. Usually the action uh, ended when people agreed on a fair price or when governments dispatched armies. Um, and so to this 1800 riot. Um, in September 1800, the hunters and tithing men, these black loyalist lawmakers, uh, posted a code of laws that fixed prices for butter, cheese, salt beef, salt pork, rice, rum, and sugar. These hunters and tithing men, um, these so-called rebels, forbade people from denying the settlers of anything that is to be exposed of in the colony. They decided that anyone who refused to sell to the colonists and was then found carrying produce out of the colony would pay a heavy fine. They denied the white governor and Sierra Leone council the authority to interfere. And they warned colonists that they had to abide by the code or leave the colony. So it's worth stating that these food laws are slightly different than these other instances of early modern laws. Um, they regulate the prices of meat and alcohol rather than just grain and bread, and the black loyalists enact them preemptively in a time of peace rather than during a time of war. Um, most significantly, rather than being a disenfranchised population uh, rioting um, or trying to force the government to set prices, the black loyalists are attempting to reclaim their right to do so. They've already been doing it. They've already been implementing these laws um, for the last half decade, um, which I think sets them apart from other case studies. So the black loyalists rioted not merely because they were hungry, but because the Sierra Leone Council had a frin infringed upon their right to legislate against dearth. That they had enjoyed that right only in the last decade meant little. Um, once granted, its revocation proved incendiary. Now, unfortunately, the riot occurs right before the arrival of a group of the Jamaican Maroons, um, who have also been living in Nova Scotia. Um, and these Maroons put down the Black Loyalists food riot. In its wake, two of them are hanged, many others are exiled, and afterwards the Black Loyalists lose their rights to make and pass laws. Okay, so this is the sort of case study of the Black Loyalists. This is where I think that the book is going to end up in its you know, final chapters. What I'd like to do very briefly in the time remaining is to discuss the rest of this book project, um, No Useless Mouth. Um, so in these book revisions, 
Um, I'm trying to offer the first study of how a coercive system of food control gradually arose in the new United States and outposts of the British Empire. Um, and the question here is, how do we get from the American Revolution to the 1800 food riot? Um, so I want to kind of provide some background about my other case studies. Um, so in thinking about the Iroquois, um, I suggest that by the later years of war, American military raids have forced northern Native Americans to starve, resulting in a situation that paradoxically allows Native Americans to seize control of food diplomacy, um, which changes throughout the course of the war in ways that I'm happy to talk about in the question and answer period. Um, this form of Native American food diplomacy becomes the most predominant form of diplomacy um, in the North and prevails, I would argue, at least until 1795 uh, with the defeat of the Western Confederacy Indians. Um, it's at this point in time that Americans begin to enact a more restrictive form of food diplomacy. Now, the story is a bit different in the Revolutionary South, where I argue that food diplomacy fails almost entirely. Um, there, um, people try to compete with each other to block each other's food diplomacy rather than practicing it themselves. Um, and so a state of violence and vital warfare breaks out and prevails um, and helps to explain the sort of factionalism that makes the southern theater of war among Greeks and Cherokees very messy and very difficult um, to characterize. Um, in the post-war U.S. South, we also see a rise in restrictive food laws, um, which maps on to what's going on in Nova Scotia and Sierra Leone. So in thinking about this project, um, I want to suggest that the work solves two big problems. Um, they, it solves this problem in a divide between peacemaking and violence in the historiography. Um, and it addresses this problem of the large size and scope of the Atlantic world paradigm. So um, in thinking about fairly recent works, Titles like The Middle Ground, The Divided Ground, Peace Came in the Form of a Woman, and Violence Over the Land might suggest the ways that historians feel the need to write their histories in one of two camps, these histories that focus on violence or these histories that focus on accommodation and peacemaking. Um, I don't feel the need to separate out these ideas because everyone in my project is at various times a producer and supplier of food, um, a peacemaker, if you want to call it that. Um, but so too did everyone take part in violent acts of food destruction and more insidiously violent acts of food regulation and lawmaking. Um, the Americans, for example, gradually standardize a form of food destruction in which they enter native villages, set houses on fire, and pile growing corn on these burning houses to maximize the extent of destruction of Native American villages. Um, we could think about black loyalist food insecurity, prompting food laws, um, expanded political rights, um, but also violence with the Temne and riot. So food insecurity um, should prompt us to think about how um, people at the time created these systems of food control, these coercive systems of food control, um, and to think about how these systems are products of brief periods of accommodation, longer histories of war, um, and more problematic practices related to violence. In terms of thinking about this second problem, the Atlantic paradigm, um, historians have spilled a lot of ink about the fact that the Atlantic world might not be cohesive. It covers too many different regions. It stretches from the 1500s to the mid 19th century. Um, and what I want to suggest uh, is that although people were different in all of the places I consider in my own work, um, they do share common ideas about food that become pervasive by about 1800. 
um, ideas about food travel from Nova Scotia to Sierra Leone. They also travel from Indian community to Indian community um, and from Indian community to colonists and eventually to inhabitants of the new United States. I want to suggest that thinking about food helps us realize that if historians are used to thinking about colonists as an increasingly powerful group, Native Americans as a decreasingly powerful group, and the enslaved as a people with relatively no power, then food sheds light on these moments when uncertainties about power uh, remain the only constant. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much for your talk. I thought that was really fascinating. Um, I'm probably going to risk showing my own ignorance and asking a kind of big question, but I was intrigued by the way in which you set up your project as um, offering an instance of transition from early modern to modern. Um, and kind of my reference points is you were talking about some of these specific introductions and then kind of um, uh, removals of food laws in Sierra Leone was a transition from kind of mercantilist protectionist policies in uh, British Empire or imperial systems um, to a kind of po political advocacy of free trade policies and, and open markets and so on. Um, is that an argument that you're kind of trying to push towards, that we see this happening uh, in the uh, period that you're looking at in particular, and is it kind of consciously brought into any of the documents you've been studying, any of the testimonies from the time? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think it's really interesting that only a couple decades after the Americans rebel against the mercantilist system, the black loyalists come out in favor of laws that are mercantilist. Um, they fix prices. Um, and, you know, there's work by people like Kathy Matson that, that suggests that ideas about free trade do gain some traction uh, during the early years of the revolution. But by the 1780s, 1790s, the U.S. is back to fixing prices, back to regulating things. Um, and I think in one sense, there's a similar um, reaction, maybe not a similar reaction, but there's a reaction to the black loyalists that they're almost going too far um, in the direction of regulation, um, or at least that they should not be the ones doing the regulating. Um, and post-rebellion, um, post-1800, the white Sierra Leone Council does institute free trade regulations um, that lift the taxes and imports on commodities that come into and out of Sierra Leone. Um, they're not talking about it in terms of free trade or mercantilism, in part because these are sort of anachronistic terms. Um, but yes, that's part of the, the discussion that I'm engaging in. Yeah, following up on that, I think there's an enormous debate in the 1790s in Britain about this, this issue. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it falls, as I understand it, on the side of not fixing prices. Mm -hmm. So you get a whole series of, of riots mm -hmm. in the 1790s, which are There's are a huge riot in 1800 in England. Yeah, which is about trying to, people trying to fix or set prices. And Portland, who's the um, in charge of the Home, home Office and also of Colony, is very anti price fixing. So it's quite interesting that you've got that, those contrasting mm -hmm. sort of attitudes going on. I think it is interesting, and I think the fact that, you know, the riot occurs at the same time, it occurs in the same month as the riots that are going on in England, um, which I just find fascinating. Um, so I agree that, you know, thinking about stronger connections with what's going on in England could be a useful way um, of coming at this. So thank you. Um, I was just thinking about broader discussions of uh, the nature of, of exchange with native peoples. Mm -hmm. um, in that there is a, a sort of idea that 
part of what happens with colonization and, and empire is that the notion of exchange of commodities fundamentally shifts its meaning. Mm -hmm. um, and that this notion that you, you have a market in which you're shifting commodities in order actually to get profit alters the meaning of the exchange. I mean, we had a colleague in, in this department sometime, Dave Murray, who looked at um, native and white encounters under the, and published a, a book under the title of Indian Giving, which uh, suggested that for many Native Americans, the initial exchanges, which might include food, would have a different meaning for them than simply a commercial one. Your case study is kind of validate that for this period or has it kind of already reached a stage for the native peoples that you're dealing with are already in a kind of commodified economy in which food is part of the exchange process? Okay, um, so thank you for answering, asking that question. Um, so one of the things that I didn't talk about in terms of explaining why the revolution matters has to do with the fact that diplomacy is also in flux right in the years before the American Revolution. So I would agree that before 1764, uh, food is just another commodity that's traded, um, bought and sold, and that it's something that like trade goods are understood differently by Native Americans and by Europeans. Um, the thing is, in the historiography, Historians have talked extensively about the fact that trade diplomacy starts to suffer in the 1760s, in part because of the regulations imposed by Jeffrey Amherst, um, despite uh, Sir William Johnson, who's superintendent of Indian Affairs, um, despite uh, Johnson's protestations. So uh, diplomacy starts to falter because the British start to circumscribe their budgets, making it very difficult to provide Native Americans with trade gifts. Um, and the British prove kind of incapable of replicating trade diplomacy as practiced by the French before the beginning of the Seven Years' War. Um, so I suggest in my work that although trade diplomacy doesn't disappear, food diplomacy becomes as important by the time that the revolution breaks out um, and that it becomes a more useful way for people to communicate with each other. But I also say that it's that food kind of skirts this idea of economic dependency um, because in contrast to trade goods, which Indians can't produce, um, food is something that everyone can produce. Um, and so it challenges Europeans' ideas that Indians need food from them. Um, it challenges these notions that Native Americans require these gifts or these payments of goods. Um, and I think there are also moments during the revolution, particularly after John Sullivan's campaign of 1779, where Iroquois Indians um, actively refuse British gifts of food and indeed destroy the food supplies of their British allies. Um, so I think food is really different um, and useful for thinking about these power relations in different ways and new ways. Well, I was thinking specifically of the Sierra Leonean context mm -hmm. in terms of the relative newness of the mm -hmm. colony and the relative newness of, if, if I'm accurate in this, in terms of the relations with native peoples in the area, particularly for the black loyalists. Mm -hmm. um, because as I understood what you were saying, the, um, the natives, in a sense, see a moment of economic opportunity initially, mm -hmm. where they have food and they can see the settlers are in need of that, and therefore mm -hmm. they should be able to get a good price. Mm -hmm. And what they see the settlers doing is, is kind of seeking to use force mm -hmm. to obtain goods at the price that is more beneficial to them. Mm -hmm. And then later on, it seems as if there's a possibility in which the, the council or somebody decides that actually, if we let the natives come in under looser terms, mm -hmm. then actually we will uh, have a, a, a more, a better relationship with them and that there's a kind of a shift in that stage. So is there, is there something about the cycle of settlement mm -hmm. or the progression of settlement that affects these relations? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So I think there is a cycle 
that's probably present in most studies of colonization that I've looked at, and, and the cycle starts out with colonizers being relatively arrogant about their ability to provide for themselves, relatively arrogant about their own military prowess. Um, and I think that this reversal occurs because the British Council realizes that they don't actually have the force to compel mm. the prices that they want. And not only do they not have the force to compel the prices that they want, they don't have the forces to protect their own colonists from violence when those prices provoke conflict. Um, so there is a kind of reversion back um, that is dependent on a change in relations. Um, <laughs> so you mentioned a few times in your talk that um, kind of food sources like cattle were poisoned and also like that case with the, mom, the Kamal tea when actually he wasn't or she wasn't really poisoned and everyone just had this kind of reaction. Um, so obviously bringing underneath the idea of food insecurity is also a paranoia towards your food, your food sources and consumption. Um, and it struck me that, you know, I kind of look at food in the contemporary day and there's this whole, I think one could argue that the way um, kind of American relationships with food, there's been a, a sense of toxicity and that's kind of adapted to a kind of historical moment. So I'm really interested that that's actually, that was around in your time period as well. Um, and I was just wondering, um, to what extent were the discussions around food scarcity and um, kind of the anxiety around this related to health and um, public health? Because uh, that's kind of something that has been missing. I, I've kind of felt that, you know, in, in your talk, so I just wondered if you could say a little bit more about that. Was health related to these concepts? Um, I mean, there are certainly significant outbreaks of disease in 1792 at the same time that the sort of hunger and short rations are taking place. Um, but I don't know whether it's linked to the food. My guess is that it's more linked to malaria. It's more linked to an inability to build shelters during the rainy season. Um, and it's linked to, again, this idea that colonists are just not as prepared as they should be. Um, or maybe that's unfair. Maybe that's imposing our, you know, I'm sure if I was, um, well, I don't know that I'd survive. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I'm not going to be arrogant about that. Um, but I think there, it, it goes back to a lack of preparation um, in colonization. But there, you know, there are certainly concerns about poison um, that pervade exchanges during this time period. So Clarkson um, gets a letter from his brother, Thomas Clarkson, who has maybe the tiniest handwriting ever. Um, his manuscripts are in the British Library. And Clarkson, I think it's Clarkson, um, writes to him saying, be careful of how you accept food from the natives because they have the art of poisonry. Um, and so you need to drink from a cup before you offer it to them. Um, so there is a kind of suspicion going on at the same time that these health problems are occurring. Mm -hmm. Hi, um, I was just thinking about what you're saying about food diplomacy and the different kind of warfare people were enacting with the food. And I was thinking about the idea of food boycotts. So that's something we have in the 20th and 21st century. So Nestle boycotting South African produce, Israeli produce. Can you see any parallels happening in like the 1790s, 1800s, where there's real kind of consumer power, I guess, to not buy food from certain sources or producers? Um, I think that there is a, I mean, there's a sugar boycott that's tied to the abolitionist movement. Um, and I think that the decisions that the black loyalists are making are kind of opposed to those decisions, um, but I can't think of the specific example that I'm thinking of to answer your question. Um, obviously, ideas about boycotts harken back to the 1760s in the American colonies when people, you know, stopped drinking tea and 
all that. Um, but it's also worth pointing out that the way that people deprive themselves of food offers a different definition of food insecurity um, compared to what we'd think of today. So when we talk about food security today, I think the, the tendency is to think about a powerful United States that distributes food aid to stem the tide of communism. Um, and that US is capable of offering so much food aid because it has a, a surplus. Um, and 18th century Americans don't necessarily have a food surplus. They're not necessarily self-sufficient. Um, and during times of war, towns deliberately make themselves food insecure. They deliberately send food out of the colony because they're afraid that if they're attacked, troops are going to steal the food and use it for themselves. Um, I wonder if you could say a bit more about um, the way that their white contemporaries characterized African African American food waste. Um, you know, I'm familiar with the way in which uh, people like Jefferson obviously focus on their physical and mental differences, but uh, the, the way in which those who have got food doesn't immediately spring to mind. But presumably, there's a, a larger discourse about um, agricultural innovation and improvement, which is tied to ideas of enlightenment. Mm -hmm. white enlightenment. So have you come across um, figures talking about those kinds of um, visual differences uh, alongside those other differences? Yeah, yeah. In the, in the planning for the Sierra Leone colony, um, people like Granville Sharp and William Wilberforce and Thomas Clarkson are talking about the types of commodities that the, the prospering colony is going to be able to produce to raise money. Um, and there is a very clear sense that indigenous Africans can grow some crops better than the colonists can, um, whether those colonists are black loyalists or whites. Um, so I think there's a sense that Africans should be the ones growing rice because no one can grow it better than they can. Um, there's also a movement introduced by Sharp, I think, to call the black loyalists Africans, um, and this never takes off. Um, and it's worth pointing out that less than a quarter of the black loyalists actually come from Africa. Most of them are born in the American colonies. Um, so there are two sort of conflicting ideas going on. There's the idea that there are clear differences between the black loyalists and the Africans. And then there are efforts to make them all one group of people um, at the same time that people are voicing doubts that one half of those groups of people can grow food as well as the other. And do, do they perceive that Africans or African Americans require a different diet? Or is it, are they like, assuming that they will eat the same kinds of things that the white? Um, I think that's probably more tied to region than it is to race. Um, so there's documents from both portions of the, the military, from, from British and Amer American militaries, um, saying that people in the North should have uh, rice only if they're sick, whereas in the South, rice is a staple of ration diets and everyone gets it. Yeah, I was just wondering how, how the, the food issue is being impacted by slave trading in this area, because obviously it's still going on. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how much in the particular locality there would have been relationships between that slave trading aspect and, and the indigenous African people. I mean, certainly along that coast more broadly, they would have been used to having quite um, long-term relationships with slave mm -hmm. traders. Um, there would be negotiations over how that, that trading would go on. So I'm wondering how Sierra Leone and the, <coughs> and the food issue fits within that broader picture. Yeah, they're, they're surrounded by slave trading societies. Um, and I, I haven't found evidence of any of the people I study saying this, but I suspect that the colonists' abolitionist goals 
might have made them less willing to in interact with slave ships that might have brought food supplies. Um, there are also certainly concerns that when the colony becomes food insecure, that colonists are going to desert and join these slave trading factories. Um, and for that, you know, for a former slave to become a, a slave trader is pretty bad PR for the Sierra Leone company. Um, so that's definitely a concern. There are also concerns about re-enslavement. Um, and there are a handful of colonists who are um, re-enslaved um, by um, one of the indigenous African groups in the area. So it's a very pressing issue, um, I think, and one that's on people's minds. Um, but I haven't found clear links in the archives um, of fears of slave trading being directly related to food supply. Um, I was wondering how the sort of patterns that you've identified and are picking up here fit in in America, how they fit in with some of the work that people are doing on borderlands further in the West and, and the South. Kind of, there's been a lot written on, on the importance of horses and planes, mm -hmm. planes and things which are. Mm -hmm. um, and is there a same kind of use as of food um, to, to kind of, I don't know, Brian DeLay's book talks about kind of the, the impact that Indian raids had on Mexico in terms of exacerbating tensions between the United States and Mexico and the things mm -hmm. which relate to the Europe. But is there a same sense they use food as a weapon there or as a, as a tool there? Yeah, so in terms of drawing on animal studies like Camarinans, like Virginia Anderson's, one of the things I'm trying to do is to emphasize that when people steal animals, um, it's also a deliberate act of depriving people of food. Um, I mean, it's it's worth thinking about how people at the time think about animals differently. Um, they're not called just cattle, they're called beef cattle. Um, future Secretary of War Henry Knox has this whole plan about training cattle to carry flour. Um, and it's, you know, going to provide a, a double source of food because once the cattle carry the cattle to a specific location, you can then kill and butcher the cattle and eat them too. Um, so I, I am trying to emphasize that stealing cattle or horses um, and then maiming them or killing them um, is more than just a symbolic act. It's something that can actually deprive people of food. Did that plan work? Yeah. No, no. <laughs> the cor so that correspondence um, takes place in the Anthony Wayne papers at the Historic so uh, Historical Society of Pennsylvania. Um, and Knox brings it up two or three times to different people until someone finally writes to him and says, listen, buddy, <laughs> this is not going to work. You need to, you know, okay. let's move on. Let it go. Any other questions? Yeah, I'm